Um, for everyone that is joining that I don't know, my name is Daniel Warlow. I work for Campari America. I'm the Italian portfolio ambassador. Um, one of the brands that I work on is Averna. It's on my t-shirt over here. Story's got a, a bottle right next to her. Um, Averna is an amazing product. It's been around for 150 years. Yeah, she, she also has the coffee cup. I love that. I'm going to get one of those at some point. Um, Averna has been around for 152 years. Uh, it is made in Caltorosetta, which is in Sicily, Italy. Um, it is made in the same facility that it has been made in for 152 years, uh, which is a converted monastery. The reason why I make that point is that um, it has been made there and in that place because the recipe came from an abbey, um, which is about a mile down the road from that monastery. And that recipe was developed by Capuchin monks uh, in the late 1700s, early 1800s. We don't really have an exact date, um, but that Abbey is still there. Um, it is still very much functioning. Um, as a company, we take pride in the fact that uh, we produce this amazing product the exact same way. Um, our master blender, Piero Fici, uh, makes Averda the exact same way every time that it's been made for 152 years. It's a very, very simple product to make, but it is also very, very delicious. Um, I know a lot of people when they see a Verna, when they talk about it, they always say it was either one of the first Amari they ever had, or if it wasn't necessarily the first, it was definitely kind of a gateway of some sort for them. Um, a Verna is beautifully balanced on the palate. Uh, I think for me, I started working with it in cocktails in like 2008 or 2009, I think was the first recipe I had for a Verna, um, where I made like a kind of a bourbon smash of sorts with it. And it was so beautiful and so wonderful. Um, so uh, enough of the story of Averna. Let's get into the form and function of it. And today we have a very special guest, Story Stewart is joining us. Um, she has prov provided some wonderful photos and slides for us and uh, some delicious uh, cocktail and dessert uh, suggestions for us. So uh, Story, thank you so much for doing that. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. And I'm going to let you take it away from here. And I'm going to enjoy all of the beautiful photos you put together. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Story Stewart. And um, I'm the owner of Beans and Barler located in St. Petersburg, Florida. We also have a uh, satellite location inside Tropicana Field where the Tampa Bay Rays play. Unfortunately, we are not um, open this season, but we're looking forward to next season. And um, we just introduced our new mobile barler, which is an awesome copper airstream. So really excited to hit the road and start doing some pop-up events. Um, gonna show you some slides. And um, one of the things that we are really known for is our themed takeovers. Um, Beans and Barler is a really special place to me. It is the fusion of um, all of my favorite things, really, coffee, cocktails, and desserts. And we try to create a spirited riff on um, a lot of popular desserts and also new creations. And that's something that, you know, if you work in the beverage industry, you're familiar with, um, you know, the excitement of creating new flavor profiles and pairing spirits together. And we get to experience that excitement with using the spirits and creating desserts. Um, Basically every month we um, release a new themed menu and we like to decorate our whole shop based on that theme. Um, there's some pictures here of a couple of our bigger themes. We did um, Beans and Barler in the Chocolate Factory, which was our Willy Wonka theme and um, Candyland. And luckily I have a staff who um, loves to participate and lets me dress them up so we can do fun events like this but um, we kind of do these costume parties to round out the end of a theme and get everybody to come in dressed up if they'd like. And um, that'll be like the exit of our spirited desserts. So I wanna go into a little bit of detail, um, kind of from a business perspective of um, why introducing a spirited dessert program is so great. Um, the first being, you know, as a part of the food and beverage industry, we all do it because we're passionate, but you also have to be able to make the numbers work. And having a um, exciting dessert program um, 
can really encourage guests to order your desserts and it can really help increase your guest check average. I think in the last restaurant that I worked in, our um, dessert attachment percentage was like 20% of guests added a dessert to their entree and having something that really sets you apart that is homemade, especially that utilizes your spirits or even if you have a specialty cocktail that people um, know you for and then cr to create a dessert riff on that um, really encourages people to order it and can be a great um, way for you to increase your guest check average. Um, another great thing to add is a spirited um, coffee cocktail menu and um, you have the ability to even sell both of those things at the end of a meal or at the end of um, you know a cocktail. Someone have a spirited dessert and a coffee beverage paired with it. It's also really great um, for um, you know your online presentation. Um, something that gets people really excited. It's something that isn't um, as mainstream as a lot of different um, food and beverage. Um, items. So something that people will likely take a picture of or tell their friends about, you know, I went to this bar, this restaurant, and we had this um, great Amari ice cream um, or dessert or coffee, and um, they'll post it online. We get a lot of people who come and take pictures of our desserts and they share it and they will tag stuff like um, there's booze in here or cocktail for dessert or dessert cocktail. And it's a great way to drive more attention and traction to our business that costs us zero dollars in advertising. Um, so those are all great reasons to um, have a spirited dessert program as part of your um, menu or as an offering that you offer in your business. Um, my first recommendation, if you are interested in starting a spirited dessert program, is to start really simple. Um, at Beans and Barler, our main thing is the spirited desserts. Uh, but even so, when we started out, we had, you know, one menu. We didn't have a specialty menu or a themed menu. It was just the one menu. And we tried to cover all of the bases with um, spirits and um some cocktails and coffees. And then we paid really close attention to our guest feedback and the things that people were excited about and the things that they posted pictures of. And then also, um, you know, who were our customers? When we opened, we really thought that we would be this like dark kind of sexy place where everyone came on dates and it was gonna be a special, um, more high-end location. And then when we opened, we just had like droves of really young people who were excited to, you know, try our desserts and take pictures and post it online. So we had to kind of run more um, with the um, photographic kind of desserts and still maintain the quality, but really um, take advantage of that opportunity to um, get that kind of business and cater products to the people who were most frequently coming. Um, at the start of the pandemic, uh, a lot of things kind of changed for us because we could no longer, of course, be open for a while. We couldn't have any events that encouraged a lot of people to come to our storefront. And um, so we had to think of a way to create an experience that we brought to people in a safe way. So uh, my partner actually came up with the name Peter Quarantale this was for Easter and um, our original, we purchased this Easter bunny costume because we thought we would just have the Easter bunny at the shop and we would have, you know, a themed menu and kids could come visit or people could take pictures with him. We ended up creating a separate website for Peter Quarantale and we did spirited Easter baskets and um, created all different kinds of different um, packages that people could pre-order, um, champagne baskets, truffle baskets, some things for the kids. We partnered with a local brewery and um, tried to like have something for everyone. And then of course the option to have a visit from Peter Quarantale. And um, we had just as many adults send this to their friends as people um, book it for their kids. We ended up having to send out three Easter Bunny teams that day and um, everyone had a heat stroke, but it was totally worth it. 
it was a it was a great way to generate a lot of revenue for one day for us and we were able to bring kind of like a little magical experience to our guests in a socially distant safe way and still kind of like keep the magic in a holiday after easter we realized that that wasn't really like a long-term kind of thing um, and we needed to um, really work on turning our experience into a product. And um, that that was the introduction of our ice cream cakes. And um, we created these spirited ice cream cakes. First, it was just like a fully custom menu. You select what spirited ice creams you wanted, what whipped creams and what um, toppings. And then the guests would order and we would, um, you know, custom make the cake and they'd come pick it up at a scheduled time. And uh, that was a lot of customer service and labor that we could not keep up with. So um, we were able to um, spend a lot of time on the e-commerce and get a much more efficient website built for us. Um, and that was a great way to um, keep the business going and send a product home that we were making while we couldn't have customers in shop. Um, the cakes were great because they're a higher dollar amount than just a drink or just a scoop of ice cream. And we were able to tack on to our website um, bottled coffee beverages and cocktails and um, really send our experience home with our guests and keep our staff working as much as we could possibly um, keep them in their hours during the stay at home and while we were still to go only. And um, that's been a really great thing for our business. And it'll be great once we can get going again, it'll be an extra revenue opportunity for us. Um, so from the, from the business perspective, if you are, um, if you are considering adding a spirited dessert program, um, you want to consider your menu stability, sustainability. And that's, you know, how are you going to make the things? What fits into your brand? Um, of course, like the really extravagant things that we're doing might not be your brand, but maybe you want to create, um, you know, some kind of dessert that is totally encompassing of a certain spirit that you love to highlight in your bar or, um, you know, a pairing menu that goes great with cocktails, um, little bites. You have to think about what can you provide to your guests every day. Um, even with our menus that change, we have people who come in asking for something we had months ago, and it's really hard to turn them away, but um, especially harder when we sell out of something, people specifically came to have that. So um, whatever you're introducing, you want to make sure that you can fulfill the, the need for that item um, for whatever amount of time that you're promising to have it. Um, a lot of these desserts can be labor intensive, but some things there are some things that you can make with very little investment of time or equipment. Um, sourcing your product, um, you have to consider if it makes more sense for you to make these items in house or um, if it's more valuable to create some local partnerships. We um, try to work with local bakers and bakeries, but um, there are definitely some pros and cons to this, um, baked goods, um, you know, perish. And especially now in the time of the pandemic, best case you have 50% of your dining room full, you're getting 50% of your revenue coming in, you have to really watch every dollar. And um, having like a waste of baked goods can be really devastating to um, your profits and losses. Um, but it can also alleviate your need to have the labor or the equipment to create a dessert. Um, making something in house, it's great to say house made, but it can also be just as great to say locally made by this baker, um, especially if that baker has a really local loyal following, they can also drive business to you to come try something that you created in partnership or collaboration. And you can really help them out from the spirit standpoint um, converting a recipe to um, include the spirit or an element of the dessert to include the spirit. Um, so you just need to figure out if you have the ability to create something in-house and if you have the ability to actually do that um, on like a long-term basis. 
We like to partner with local bakeries for things that go inside of our ice creams now because once the product is frozen, the shelf life is far extended beyond just a baked good. So um, we are leaving, alleviating ourselves of the potential to lose money on baked goods that go stale. Um, so for us, um, we kind of talked about like how things changed for us in the pan pandemic. Um, now that we're back to kind of, out we have outside dining, um, we are converting a menu that works great for us, but um, I want to go over some technical points that um, highlight some methods and some strategies of how we get these spirits into our desserts and um, how you can do that in your bar or how you can do it even at home. Um, there are some technical points that you want to think about. Um, alcohol, for one, is a liquid, like at any spirit. So um, if you are including it in a recipe, you're going to need to substitute other liquids in that recipe and not add them. Um, you know, baking, they say, is the science. It's completely true. Um, but it's not, it's not always as simple as a one-to-one -one substitution for something. Um, spirits have different viscosities to, um, you know, wet ingredients that you'd be adding into baked goods. And um, this just comes with trial and error. If you're adding it into a recipe, start, start with a small batch and make adjustments based on your observations um, with how things are coming out. Ice cream is our main spirited dessert that we offer. Um, we infuse as many flavors into our ice creams as possible. We try not to use any extracts or flavorings because your spirit is already um, a much thinner liquid than any ice cream base that you would use. And you wanna still end up with a really thick, creamy, um, textured product. So um, we try to steepen any flavor that doesn't dilute your product. Um, I have a picture here of um, an example of our ice cream base. This is actually a recipe that we made with the Averna. And um, we create a very thick custard base and um, infuse all of these spices. This ice cream I'm calling our Hello Good Night because, um, you know, a dessert, um, especially with an Amari, is something that you would have at the end of your night, but um, it's also caffeinated, so it would be a great scoop of ice cream to enjoy at any time. And this is kind of a play on a dirty chai. So instead of using like a chai tea or even a chai concentrate and mixing that in with our base, we just steep the spices into the ice cream. So you're getting all of the flavor and you have more control over the flavor and you're not adding anything to dilute your base. Um, so we have some coarse ground coffee and um, in my chai blend, we have some black peppercorn, star anise, um, some whole cloves, cardamom, cinnamon, and um, the steep time is something that you also, also want to pay a lot of attention to. Um, if you have a good understanding of brewing coffee or steeping tea, this will be um, very easy to understand. But um, any tea steeps at uh, an ideal temperature that's specific to that tea. So an herbal tea um, has typically a lower steeping temperature than say like a black tea. And um, you wanna pay attention to the temperature of your base. You can also cold steep your um, spices or any ingredient. It would just um, alter the time that you're steeping. Um, and the, this is, this is um, great to, the ice cream base steeping is great because you can taste it along the way and see how the flavor has changed. And then over time you'll understand the best way to um, steep each particular ingredient. But definitely a, re a method that I recommend for flavoring your ice cream bases without um, losing any of the rich quality. Um, once I'm sorry, it's can, I ask you, can I ask you a question about um, when you're using Amari or any other alcohol, especially for ice cream base, does the alcohol degree, do you have to be careful if it's too high in alcohol or too low in alcohol to put in the ice cream so it freezes or doesn't freeze? Yes. Yeah, so, um, 
with any with any spirit, um, the ABV of that spirit will, um, you know, play a factor into the the um, temperature and churn time of the ice cream. But it's particularly important, especially for higher ABV spirits, that you have a very thick base. Um, so uh, the the main thing that we use for our ice cream base is egg yolks. Um, but we, we cook down a very thick custard base and then we're able to add, um, you know, the spirits and we don't lose any quality in the texture of the ice cream. Some flavors of ice cream that we churn, we have to churn for a longer time um, to be able to get the right consistency out of the machine. And then it will take longer once we get it to our deep freeze uh, to become a hardened product. Um, in a non-commercial setting, if you were making a spirited ice cream at home, you wouldn't be able to get as high of an ABV typically because residential freezer doesn't get as cold as commercial. Um, but you can definitely, if you're getting the right thickness in your base, get a good ABV out of your um, ice creams. The Amaris are great because they're lower ABV and um, the Averna has so much flavor. You don't need um, you know, a 50, 50, 50 ratio of the spirit to the ice cream base to get the flavor of the spirit because it has so much flavor in itself. Um, and you're really not focused on getting the highest ABV out of an Amari ice cream. It's more about the experience of enjoying the spirit, getting the flavor of it, and then and, and enjoying just the flavor of it, not worrying about like, oh, is this ABV ice cream gonna get me feeling buzzed at the end of the night. You really just wanna enjoy it as a delicious dessert. But um, definitely the ABV of the spirit plays a big factor into um, the churn time and temperature and how long you have to freeze before it's ready to actually serve. Um, another thing that I would recommend, whether you're making it in a commercial setting or at home, um, we add the spirit right before churning. Um, some, the, the Averna I think would be fine if you put it ahead of time, but there's really no reason to. And um, I've seen with higher acidity flavors and higher ABV spirits that you start to see um, like some curdling in the base. So if you're going right into the churner where it's gonna be mixing, um, it doesn't give the opportunity to the ice cream to start like having any of those bits start to like form together. So we just add the spirit straight, straight going into the churner. And I think that's the best time to incorporate the spirit. If you were trying to just get the flavor out of the spirit and um, not have the ABV, then you would be adding it in the cooking process of your base and then the heat would cook out the um, alcohol and you would still be left with the flavor of the spirit. So that's also an option. Um, the, the laws are different in every state at this time um, about alcoholic food products. In Florida, it's pretty lenient. There really aren't a lot of regulations. It's considered a food product once churned. But um, if you are considering adding a spirited dessert, it's always worth checking into um, with your with your local um, either DBPR or um, Department of Agriculture. Um, so I'm gonna show you, I think one of my favorite ice cream sundaes I've made in a very long time, um, this Averna Dirty Chai ice cream. And um, on top, I made a um, waffle cone that's actually with Averna as well. And um, it just has a bit of orange zest and cardamom. And uh, I had this great epiphany when I tried this waffle cone crisp with the Averna that um, this kind of tasted like delicious gingerbread. And I'm really excited going into the winter season to make some great Averna gingerbread cookies. I love that. I can't wait. And then uh, we have a dark chocolate spoon. So I love the combination of dark chocolate and the Averna. 
Um, Story, there's a question that came through, and this is actually, I think, pretty applicable now for this photo, but I know you have some other great photos. Um, but the question was, how do you build those super Instagrammable drinks? Is there a trick, any advice to doing that? I mean, obviously the spoon was a great addition to this. It's obviously also edible, but any other tricks? Yeah, and you know, I think I think there's always a balance. Um, you want to like have extravagant things, but you also don't want to like sell out and have like just gimmicky stuff. So we always try to keep like a very high quality to all of our ingredients, and then also add the Instagrammable element. But you want to still be proud of what you're giving your guest. Um, a great a great thing for um, like Instagrammable desserts is making your own whipped cream. Um, and the, you know, the whip canisters that you use, the little nitrogen cartridges, you can do so many different things with those. Like you can make spirited whipped creams, you can make spirited mousses or not. Um, but that's a, a very cheap piece of equipment. There's very little investment and you can make these things in seconds. Um, and then also like, it's a lot about the presentation, like the glassware, um, enjoying a dessert out of a martini glass or a coupe glass, it feels more luxurious. It's something that you're more likely to take a picture of than just giving someone, you know, a styrofoam cup. So um, presentation's a lot of, of the game and garnish. Um, the person who asked that question, if you um, would like, feel free to DM me or email me like a specific dessert and I can give you some pointers on that particular item, but um, you always want to be able to tell the story of the item and the time, love, and passion that went into creating it, and I think that goes a long way with the guests. Um, as for baking with a spirit, um, I have some notes on um, creating like batters or if you're making a dough. And um, when, when I'm adding the liquid ingredient, and I'm just gonna use cookie dough as an example, um, your first steps would be to cream your butters and sugars. So you would do that normally. And, um, and then you incorporate your dry ingredients. And the next part would be to add your liquids in and get to the right um, consistency for your dough or batter. So what I would recommend is after you cream your butters and sugars and you add in your um, sifted dry ingredients, I use the spirit first and um, I focus on the flavor. So I will add the spirit until I get the right flavor out of that um, dough or batter. And um, then I'll see maybe I need to add more dry ingredients to get it to the right texture, or maybe I can add more of the, or introduce the milk um, or whatever wet ingredient I would have normally added in place of the spirit in that recipe. So I will always um, add the spirit first and get to the right consistency and the right flavor um, before worrying about the final product. Cause you wanna say, if you're saying I'm making a wild turkey cookie dough like I have in this next picture, you want people to taste that cookie dough and say, this is made with wild turkey, I taste it. You don't want them to be searching for the flavor. You want that to be very obvious. Or people just say, this is a gimmick. You just said, this is boozy, whatever, but I can't taste it. You wanna stand behind the flavor and the product. And so here I made, a um, raspberry brownie batter with wild turkey and ruby cacao chips. It is one of my favorite things I've ever made. It's so delicious. Um, we um, are currently doing a raw cookie dough menu. And um, the great thing about like doing something like this is it's very easy to make a, a dough edible raw or um, something that can go both ways, whether you can, you're going to cook it or serve it raw or both. Um, but a dough like this, you can make a big batch of, you can freeze, you can refrigerate, it has a really great shelf life, and then you can part out and bake as needed. So you're not taking on like the risk of having so many baked goods that you have to sell in a short time. Um, you can bake as needed and not have to like 
make a huge mess making a dough each time you want to make it. So um, it's really important to think of the efficiency and like how you can manage making an extra thing every single day. And this is a great, a great way to implement a spirited dessert or make like bake, bake off this brownie or serve it as a raw dough. Um, another opportunity to upsell in your bars to have recommended pour overs that go with your desserts, even if your desserts aren't spirited to say, to have, you know, recommendations like this dessert pairs well with this spirit, um, or, um, this dessert pairs well with this coffee cocktail. And then that encourages people to, um, purchase more than one thing or, purchase that thing at a higher dollar amount and um, really increase your guest check averages. Um, and sorry, we had another question come through. And so I'm sorry, we're going to kind of go back to ice cream for this one. But the oh, yeah. question is, is there a way to incorporate acids or citrus for some sort of sour ice cream? Yes. Um, so I um, one of our most popular flavors is our key lime martini ice cream. And um, just like the spirits, I add the um, key lime juice and a good amount of it because the same thing, if you say there's a flavor in something, you want that to be very obvious um, right before churning. If you add it before and you let it sit for any amount of time, you will start to see a separation. So I will add that right, right into churning. Um, another great way, um, if you want to make a cream based acidic ice cream, um, you can help um, cut back the acidity by adding sugar to that element or creating like kind of a simple syrup out of it. And that will help that will help it bind better into the base. But if you're adding it as it's going into the churner where it's going to be circulated immediately, it is a, a good bet that you'll have a very creamy product. Um, sorbets are also really popular. Um, it's great because, um, you know, developing a dairy free cream based ice cream is a challenge. Um, it's been a challenge for us. I think we finally, after several years of making ice cream, have a great dairy free base. Um, but the sorbets are a great way to have something fruity on your menu and um, something that accommodates dairy-free dietary restriction. And they're great in cocktails. So, um, for example, we make a, a lychee champagne sorbet and um, we take the whole canned lychees and blend it down. We don't strain it. I like the um, like pulp of fruit in the sorbets so long as it's not like chunky. Um, and that adds like a good thickness to the texture. Um, but you can, same concept with like a citrus or something acidic, make a nice textured sorbet with a spirit and not have to worry about the curdling if you don't have like a commercial spinning batch freeze ice cream machine. Yeah, we always make um, uh, like a sage lemon soda that we pair with a verna. And I think like lemon goes really well with a verna. And I could really see like a lemon sorbet or something that's like really acidic and tart pairing well with that, or even like some sort of float or something like that. This really has my mind turning and also my stomach at the same time. By the way. So I, I love that idea of like some sort of super acidic, um, like sorbet or ice cream with it. It'd be so good. Oh yeah. And um, to add with the citrus and Averna um, synergy, coffee is also a great element in that um, it's really popular in Italy to um, have an espresso and you get like a citrus peel on the side, I say for the bitterness. But um, when I was like a baby drinker, one of my, I loved um, drinking a spiked coffee at the end of the night, but a lot of the bars that we went to like in college weren't really professionals that creating a Irish coffee or anything. You end up with like something with like green sprinkles on top. And uh, so, so I would always order a, a coffee and a B52 shot. And I would just pour that into the coffee. And I just I always loved that kind of citrus element in the coffee. And it's great with Averna. Um, that is the next thing that we're actually going to talk about is um, the uh, incorporating into um, coffee beverages. And um, the 
The greatest thing about the coffee cocktails is you have the ability to create um, a hot beverage or a cold beverage. And even a lot of the, your recipes, you can offer either way. Um, they're also a great day or night. So if you have, a, if you're open for brunch or you're open late night, there are a lot of people who would love a caffeinated cocktail at some point in their night or during the day. They're very popular. Um, so I, I think it's a great, great, uh, um, portion of a cocktail menu and it's offered. Um, you have a lot of seasonal opportunities and um, and of course it's a great way to boost your checks. Even if someone ordered a um, one of your coffee cocktails, non-alcoholic, and then also got a cocktail, it's increasing the, your guest check average. Um, and there's a great margin usually on um, coffee and coffee cocktails. Um, it's also a great way to have a local partnership with a roaster. Um, you know, there are so many small batch coffee roasters. We work with an amazing coffee roaster in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, but there are so many coffee roasters who create really awesome roasts and even they could make you a custom coffee blend. There could be an opportunity for you to sell your coffee blend as a retail product, like something that people take home with them. Um, but you can have, you know, really fresh beans and give the opportunity to work with um, a local roaster. Um, and then you also have the ability to offer more non-alcoholic options to your guests, which I think is a challenge for some bars. Um, you know, you can always create like a soda type cocktail with uh, or mocktail with syrups and club soda, like an Italian style. But um, I think that there are a great portion of bars that are missing the mark on having non-alcoholic offerings to accommodate people who are in a group who are not drinking for whatever reason, but still enjoy the environment of being out. So having the um, ability to do coffee beverages um, and really specialty coffees um, is a great offering for those people. Um, in the build of a coffee cocktail, it's very similar to building, um, you know, any cocktail. The only exception would be normally in a cocktail, you would start with your cheapest ingredients and mixers and then work up to the most expensive spirit in case you mess anything up. The only thing I would recommend um, differently in the build of a coffee cocktail is if you're using um, fresh espresso shots, that'd be the last thing that you add. So first you would add in your syrups or flavors or anything and then the spirit, and then you would add your shots of espresso because espresso has a very short life where the shots are fresh and um, you don't want to worry about like waiting for those or letting them die in your cup while you're measuring out your spirits. You want it to all kind of happen at the same time. And then your incorporation of milk. Um, we actually, I, I don't know, in Italy, there's this thing called a matzo cafe, which is something we always talk about with the Verna. And the matzo cafe is the ritual of having your coffee after your meal, which obviously, you know, in Italy, a coffee is always espresso because having milk in your coffee after like 10 a.m. is like, there's you have no class. That's a really like hard and fast rule there. And so they have this espresso and and you, you know, you drink your espresso, which is really high in acid and really very bitter. And then you immediately sip an Amari of some sort. And we always use a Verna because of its balance of bitter and sweet. And when you do that, it's this immediate, like kind of synergy between the flavors, but it also kind of washes your mouth out a little bit and it allows your palate to readjust. And I think that's also a really great way of putting um, like a little bit, uh, raising your check average or putting an extra option on a menu just to have people have an experience of some sort, you know, where you can kind of do it simultaneously if they don't, you know, want to go through the whole um, experience of having a full dessert or something like that. Yes. And even just telling a story like that to your guests, um, I think is so valuable making that extra little connection with them and then them taking out a little like um, piece of culture um, is really valuable. And then it's something like once they have it one time, they will seek it out at other bars or even tell the story to their friends and order the same thing. So it's great for your bar staff to be able to know little um, stories like that and share with your guests. 
and then make it part of someone's ritual after they have a cocktail or after they have a meal to finish it out with an espresso and an Averna and tell them about how it's the perfect balance and it's a great way to get the rest of your day going. Mm -hmm. um, I've created um, a coffee with Averna. Um, it does have milk, sorry. Um, okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, because of the perfect balance of the bitter and sweet um, flavors of the um, Averna, I think it just pairs so great with dark chocolate. So I kind of did like a, an Averna um, mocha or mocha di Averna and just melted um, good dark chocolate with the espresso and then um, incorporated the Averna and steamed milk. You can do this with any preference of milk, um, but really delicious and um, a lower ABV, but I think it's just like a great balance. You have a little caffeine and it's just like a, a treat. Um, just very enjoyable coffee beverage. I love that. It looks delicious. Yeah. And a good way, you know, to um, really play on the Italian history. You can use Italian espresso beans. And um, I think any time that you can, like, make those connections with your guests is really special and adds a lot of value to your business and to the product. Um, and then we're going to talk about the topic that everyone wants to talk about, which is boozy milkshakes. Um and it's funny because when, when we opened Beans and Barler, I was pretty adamant that we were never going to do a boozy milkshake. Um, I put so much time into um, making the ice cream that I couldn't imagine putting six scoops of it into a tin and blending it up and then someone just like drink it down. Um, but... Eventually, we did make a boozy milkshake. Our first, our first boozy milkshakes were actually our Girl Scout cookie milkshakes. I have worked with the same Girl Scout for four years now. She just retired, so I'm gonna be gonna be finding a new Girl Scout. But um, we did these. We did the Girl Scout cookie milkshakes, and I was honestly shocked at how many of them we made. We had to scrape the floor every night because there were just toppings caked everywhere. <laughs> we clogged our grease trap. Oh. It's just like brutal madness every day. Girl Scout cookie milkshakes. And we oh, did but these it's so ones. worth it. Look at that. That looks yeah. amazing. We offered them, uh, we, we do them every year now, alcoholic and non-alcoholic, because um, of course people want to bring their kids to have Girl Scout cookie milkshakes. But also it's really fun, like, you know, you have the nostalgia, and it's the same with a lot of desserts. You have the nostalgia of when you enjoyed those desserts or when you had that experience, but now you've, you've elevated it um, to cater more towards the adult. So it's something that's really enjoyable for them now enjoying something that they had as a kid, but as an adult in an adult form. Um, and that's why we get so much attention over these things. I think because it's a great reminder of the past, but something that's really trendy and present. Um, so yes, we, we now have to have, um, a boozy milkshake at all times since the start of the Girl Scout cookie milkshakes. When we don't have a milkshake on our menu, it's very disappointing for our guests. And then they start doing the thing where they like pull up the Instagram and they're like flipping back months and they're like, <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. I need to set, show you a picture and see, like I'm, I'm coming here for this thing. And then they show you this, this milkshake that we don't have anymore and they're very disappointed by it. So, um, <laughs> My tips for milkshakes, um, before you before you get yourself into it, you really have to anticipate the labor. They are very labor intensive, um, obviously. Um, there are ways to cut back on the steps, like painting the rim and all the toppings, but those are the things that people get really excited about, so you have to weigh out what makes sense for your style of service. Um, but also, you know, 
you just have to explain to your guests. These take these take our time, love, and attention is what we say. Um, during like popular milkshake menus, we just have to put up a wait sign to let them know what to anticipate before they order. Um, but our motto is give the people what they want. And if they're like really hyped about the alcoholic milkshakes and we're going to do them because it, it's what brings them there. And um, so we, we just have to be excited to be a part of their experience, even if um, we have to add extra staff to be able to do it. Or, um, you know, I have to come in when it's, when we get backed up on the orders on a Saturday night, um, we're, we're all here for the guests and um, being able to like see the excitement about one of the desserts or coffee or anything that that's really why I do this. And I think that's why a lot of us, um, you know, stay in the hospitality industry for so long um, because we get to create something and then we get to share with so many other people and we get to immediately see their reaction in person, watch them enjoy something that we crafted and that makes it completely worth it. Um, so you just have to know what you're getting into ahead of time, but if you're passionate, you'll see it through and it's completely worth it. Um, just going to finish up with the slides with, um, one of my favorite quotes, um, that we have now in the shop. Um, a lot of my life has been inspired by, um, the original Willy Wonka it's my favorite movie and I think it's completely magical, but, um, the scene in the factory where, um, <laughs> Willy Wonka says candy is dandy, but liquor is quicker. Um, I just, it really applies to us. It makes a great photo opportunity for us, of course, but, um, you know, it's all about the magic of creating the, um, guest experience, and um, being a part of um, creating something that only you can create, an experience that you can only create, and the connection that you can only have with your guests, um, which is why I think we all do this. I think that you beautifully summed up <laughs> why everyone is in the hospitality industry in what, whatever form it is. And I think that's, that's an amazing thing that you are able to carry with you and also share with everyone else. And I think, you know, anybody who's ever spent, you know, the majority of their life, which a lot of us have that are watching this, you know, behind a bar or, you know, whatever form it is that you're serving people, the true joy you get is watching someone, you know, in their experience in that moment, realize that this thing is, is made for them and so perfect. And it's beautiful that you, uh, you summed it up that way. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, and then we have just one last question that came through. And this one is pertaining to um, the glassware that you use. So um, my work is considering serving a dessert in a martini glass, but we are struggling with the breakage of the more delicate glassware in the back of house dish versus the time spent scrubbing food products out of glassware behind the bar. Do you know sturdy product that can withstand back of house dish or a more efficient way of cleaning food caked glassware with a bar set up during very busy bar service? So um, the first thing that I'm going to say is that we break a lot of glassware, a lot of glassware. I'm not even phased by it anymore. It's just what I consider the cost of doing business. Um, we actually purchase most of our glassware um, vintage. Um, I love to have unique glasses. So, um, a lot of my staff, they love thrifting and if they see cool glasses, um, they'll pick them up while they're out. Um, I also will go and make some big trips and stock up on glassware. You can really get some great deals on, um, cocktail glasses that are unique and really like make a photo more special. Um, but we know that a lot of glasses don't stay around for a long time. Um, we group our glassware by size. So um, not all of our martini glasses look exactly the same, but we get gauge them by volume for each dessert. So my staff know like this volume of glass suits these desserts 
this volume of glass suits these and we'll group them like that. So um, you might get two um, whiskey berry cheesecake sundaes and they'll be in different glasses. Um, they won't look exactly the same, but that's kind of like our quirk. Um, I would recommend like we do have some stock glasses that are our just in case or like for busier times or for flights. Um, we love stemless martini glasses and um, those are very sturdy on the bottom and you don't have like the stems break off as often, but definitely want to make um, your staff immediately scrape out any food product from the glassware as soon as they can not let that go to the like go through the dish area if possible or if you have a specific person who's your dishwasher who scrapes everything out um that they're doing a really good job of that um and then maybe even having like a spatula or whatever um that fits that style of glass to do a very good scrape and then it's a lot less work on your equipment but we've definitely clogged up our grease trap a few times with um, coconut shavings and different garnishes that are on the glasses that make it through tea leaves. Mm. Um, I mean, people just need to finish their desserts. I don't know what's going on. I mean, those coconut, those coconut shavings are delicious. <laughs> yep. Yeah. The, the milkshakes are, the milkshakes are the hardest. Um, Cause you know, you have, you're painting like the side of the glass and it mm. takes some time, but if you have like, um, like a hot rag or whatever that you're using to like get most of that like sweet sticky garnishes off the side then it's much easier in the dishwashing process you just want to have like a designated um area like if you are not immediately washing them or you don't have like a person who's your dishwasher or steward um where like you say this is where the the glasses go and maybe like say you lay them fate like lay them you know upside down so they're all facing the same way or alternating so everyone knows like just place it in this way after scraping uh i think that's wonderful uh, anyone who's spent any time as a dishwasher i spent a couple years as a dishwasher it's all about organization you know what i mean and i think yeah. you've i've walked into some dish pits and i'm like what is happening here no one has control of what's happening and you know everything is everywhere there's no like bus tubs separating things and it's always mm -hmm. one of the my biggest pet peeves is like if you're if you're going to operate especially if your bar is operating at you know such a high level with such organization your district also has to operate it that way otherwise you're going to have all that breakage you're going to have you're going to lose things you know it's going to clog your drain stuff like that oh yeah and um i always um emphasize the pre-scrape. Um, even if you have a steward or a designated dish area, um, it's just like a consideration thing. Um, the, the stewards and the dishwashers, they have like the hardest job and it's like the most important job too. Like you have to have glassware, you have to have dishes, you need to keep the place clean and um, anything you can do that takes a second that um you know can alleviate some labor for that person and keep their station clean you just do it you're already touching a dirty glass you're going to wash your hands like just have a process that says like here is the bin where you dump your food out or here is like your method to scrape um but just do it before you place your dishes in that area just make it a little bit easier for that person and just keep the station a little cleaner and more organized it's very important Respect is very important, especially in our industry. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, Story, there's no more questions, but I just want to say thank you. This was very enlightening. It was also wonderful to see all the desserts and, and to speak with you. And I appreciate your time and consideration putting all this together. My, my dad actually lives down in Ruskin. So I'm going to tell him to come up and uh, bring his family with him and, and have some delicious desserts out on the patio, if that's okay with you. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and hopefully if anyone's in the area, you want to stop by, you can reach out to me before. i um, happy to meet anybody. Or if you have any questions, you can, here's our um, shop page, Beans and Barler. You can send me a DM if you think of any questions afterward or you're watching this later on. Um, and I will send you any tips or advice that I possibly can. And um, it's been really great to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Story. Appreciate it. Thanks, Portland Cocktail Week. 
Thank you, Distance Learning. Really appreciate this platform. I need to mention that as well. Um, we've got some really great stuff coming up for Negroni Week 2, which is um, September 14th to the 20th, which is a really, really awesome time for us to connect, um, especially for um, for our industry, because this year Negroni Week is, um, is all focused on our industry and, and benefiting our industry. So check us out, um, Compare Community. Um, we're going to have more of these, not just in the Italian portfolio, but our, all of our brands. So um, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.